one of the reasons we're trying to get the mind in concentration is because it allows us to see the intentions that don't want to be in concentration. If we don't set up this intention that we're going to stay here with the breath, one intention, one thought, one perception flows into another, into another, into another. The boundaries are very vague. And our intentions can hide other intentions very easily. But once you've made up your mind, you want to stay right here, then anything else that doesn't fit in with right here has to be thrown out. And sometimes it's discouraging seeing how many other intentions come in that you have to throw them out. But you're learning something important. There are these intentions, what the Buddha calls fabrications, and desires that slosh around in the mind that we don't know much about. And because we're ignorant of them, they can influence us, skew our perception of reality or the perceptions that we want to adopt, things that may seem true because they fit in with a particular desire. But if we don't know the desire, we can't be sure about how true these things are. So we're here to learn about our desires. When the Buddha talks about sensory perception, things don't just start with the fact that something comes and hits the eye. The mind is already primed to look at things in a certain way, based on the way you think, based on the way you perceive things, based on the feelings you have in the body. There have been studies to show how much your intestinal system actually runs your brain. If the intestinal system feels bad, then you're going to see things in a certain way. If it feels good, you're going to see them in another way. And that's just that one system. It's a big one. But all too often we're unconscious of what's happening. So we're here to sort out our desires to learn about them, to see which ones are actually operating when we choose a perception or choose a way of thinking. Now that requires a certain amount of stability, because there are a lot of desires in the mind that are hidden for good reason. Either we're embarrassed about what they are, or else we've realized that they're impossible, but part of the mind still wants to hold on to them. And if you don't have a good, solid place in the mind to watch these things, to see them as something separate, then it's hard to admit to them. So we still the mind, we give us the mind a good sense of well-being through the way that we breathe, through the way we relate to ourselves. So when these desires come up, you can see them clearly. If you see that something is impossible, you realize it's impossible. you're more likely to realize it's impossible because you're coming from a better place. So the Buddha has us accept not only that we can get the mind into concentration and that it is a good thing to try to get the mind to stay with one thing, but he also says, take as a working hypothesis the fact that it is possible to find true happiness, a happiness that doesn't change, a happiness that doesn't cause any harm. You can hold that as your standard. Because if you don't believe that that kind of happiness is possible, you say, well, I'll content myself with something less. It seems reasonable. I mean, think of all the people who argued with a young Buddha, telling him that his desire for awakening was impossible. Their arguments were very reasonable. They kept pointing to people in the past, saying, this great king or that great sage that said true happiness is impossible. And the Buddha said, then in that case, those people are not noble. He wanted to find, in the early stage, he wanted to find if such a thing really was possible, and that it was worth giving his life to it. And one of the meanings of his awakening is that, yes, it is possible. Through our own efforts, we can find true happiness. So think of that as a possible desire, a desire for something possible. And then you can use that as your measurement for other desires.
Notice the image true happiness is not arriving at the ultimate truth, although you do arrive at an ultimate truth. But to get there, you have to figure out, well, let's, what's the ultimate happiness? And whatever is true for the sake of that ultimate happiness, you take that as true. That's another working hypothesis. Anything that tells you that that kind of happiness is not possible, you say that's false. And then you watch your desires and see what visions of truth they have. And now you've got a measuring stick. This is an important way of understanding our perceptions of reality, or the ways we think about reality, is what desires do they serve? And do we really want to follow those desires? Now first you have to know what they are. Again, that's why we try to get the mind still, and get it to ask the right questions. And one line of question is just, just exactly this. What's the desire that underlies that perception? or my willingness to take on that perception. And this requires a fair amount of patience and a lot of honesty, because these desires are used to operating in the shadows. It's like corrupt government officials. I understand they've been complaining recently, saying people don't have any sympathy for us. We're doing a lot of hard work here. making decisions based on information they can't know. The question is, well, why can't we know? Why is this all being secret? That's how the mind works. The mind is a crafty politician. Your desires are crafty politicians. And as with any crafty politician, it is possible to find them out, but it takes a lot of patience and a lot of persistence and a willingness on your part to not identify with everything that comes up in the mind. In other words, just because a desire is there doesn't mean it's one that you want to really pursue, if you really look at it. So try to get the mind still so you can see these things, and give it a sense of well-being in that stillness. So it would be easier to say no to a desire, and not get upset about the fact that you have desires that you don't like, or at least you don't like to admit to yourself. Think of the mind as a large group of people. And some of them have had power for a long time, others are trying to assume power. You're trying to get your desire for true happiness to assume power. And the ones who've been operating through the past are not going to give up power easily. But if you have the well-being and the clarity of concentration on your side, you've got an important ally. You have the wisdom of the Buddhist Four Noble Truths on your side. That's an important ally, too. Notice the, the nature of those truths are truths about cause and effect, what's possible, what's not possible. And truths about things that are very close to your mind, truths about suffering, and what the cause is. What's the desire behind this suffering? The Buddha lists them. And what's the, what are the desires that get you out? Well, they're lists of skillful desires as well, the, the desire to get rid of unskillful qualities that are there, not let them arise if they're not there, the desire to give rise to skillful qualities, and then once they're there, the desire to maintain them. These are truths about desire and the effects of desires. That's something we can observe. Sometimes our perceptions about the world outside are hard to judge. Is it really accurate or is it not? How much information do we have? But we can know our desires. We can get a sense of which ones are skillful and which ones are not. Then you find ourselves adopting a perception, or an idea of reality that's based on an unskillful desire. 
that's enough reason to say no, even though it insists that it's true. You have to be able to say no to it, because it's serving the purposes of something unskillful inside. Whereas the perceptions that serve the purpose of what is skillful inside, you can accept those as provisional truths for the time being, as you get to know your desires better. You can begin to ferret out the desires that seem to be skillful but ultimately are not. And this is the process we all have to go through as we practice. We can't be impatient and say, well, I want nothing but true desires and true perceptions right from the beginning. We're feeling our way, but we're feeling our way not blindly and not in total darkness. The more light we can shine into the issue of what's skillful and what's not in the mind, the more we'll be able to choose our perceptions of reality that deal not only with issues in the mind but also issues outside. In a way that's more and more trustworthy. We're moving towards something that is ultimately trustworthy. On the path, we're not quite there yet, but we're moving in the right direction. So an important aspect of the practice is get to know your desires. Put yourself in a position where you can judge them wisely, fairly, but firmly. And that'll straighten out a lot of other issues in the mind right there.